Dinner for Five, Chapter One. For what must have been the tenth time in as many minutes, Jenny glanced round the interior of her restaurant. Everything seemed to be in order. The tables were neatly positioned, the chairs arranged around them in perfect symmetry. Each table was laid with a red and white checkered cloth, and the eating utensils glistened in their places. She walked quickly between the tables, checking that knives and forks were on the correct side of the settings. Her head waiter, Rafe, hovered anxiously behind her. Rafe was a good worker and a loyal employee. He was well-intentioned, cheerful and honest. In fact, he was everything Jenny could hope for in a head waiter. Except for one failing. Rafe had an unfortunate tendency to confuse his left and right hands. This meant that, from time to time, his cutlery settings became reversed, and for a perfectionist like Jenny, that was a source of extreme annoyance. Some time back, Will had more or less solved the problem. He had pointed out to Rafe that a knife was like a small sword, and so it should be used in the right or sword hand. This simple mnemonic had been remarkably effective. For some weeks after, Rafe could be seen setting tables, from time to time making a mock sword stroke to establish which hand was which and which side the knives went on. But occasionally, Jenny noticed, he became overconfident and placed the knives and forks where instinct told him they should go. When that happened, they mysteriously reversed their positions on the tables and Jenny's temper, always close to a boiling point, would explode. Her friend Alice, with a diplomat's eye for compromise, had suggested that she could solve the problem by simply folding the knife and fork together in the napkin and placing the rolled bundle in the centre of the setting. But Jenny was stubborn. Right is right and left is left, she said. Why can't he learn that? She sensed Rafe behind her as she checked the restaurant. Out of the corner of her eye, she could see that his right hand was describing small, jerky motions as he made incipient sword strokes to test the positioning of each setting. As she checked the last table, she turned to him and nodded. That's all fine, Rafe. Good work. She saw his shoulders sag in relief and a beaming smile broke out across his open, honest face. Thank you, Mistress Jenny. I tried to do my best for thee. I know, Rafe, she said. She patted his hand and for a moment regretted the number of times she had cracked him across the head with a ladle when he had failed to live up to her high standards. But only for a moment. He followed her now to the kitchen, where her assistant chef was hard at work, cutting and chopping in preparation for the evening meal. Scullery assistants hurried to and fro, bringing more food from the larder for the cook to prepare, polishing serving platters and cooking pans till they gleamed. At Jenny's appearance, the pace in the kitchen increased noticeably. Rafe could afford to be more sanguine about this part of the inspection. If something were wrong in the kitchen, he couldn't be blamed for it. Jenny cast a professional eye around the room. Somewhat to Rafe's disappointment, there seemed to be nothing wrong. He would have enjoyed seeing someone else suffer the cracking impact of Jenny's ladle on the back of their head. She gestured to a row of ducks, spitted on a long metal rod, their skins glistening with the spiced and flavoured oil that had been rubbed over them. Those ducks will have to go over the fire no later than four o'clock, she told the assistant chef. The woman looked up, blew a stray strand of hair away from her eyes and nodded. Aye, Mistress Jenny, she said. And make sure Norman turns them regularly. They must cook evenly. Aye, Mistress. Norman? You hear the mistress there? She called to a young scullery assistant who is currently bringing a basket of potatoes from the vegetable locker. I, Miss Ailsa, I, Mistress Jenny, I'll turn them regular like, never fear. Jenny nodded. The ducks would be placed on their spit over the large open fire in the dining room. 
They would be turned regularly so that the skin roasted evenly and crisped to a golden brown. The fat dripping onto the coals would sizzle and hiss and fill the room with its delicious odour, creating a truly mouth-watering atmosphere. Jenny had learned from Master Chubb, her mentor, that there was a certain amount of show business necessary in a good restaurant. There were only six ducks, but their effect on the atmosphere would far outweigh their relatively small number. Very well. Jenny cast one more look around, trying to find something out of place, something that needed correction, and failed. Her staff watched her anxiously. This would be the first time in many months that Jenny had not overseen operations in the restaurant herself. She was something like a new mother, leaving her baby in the care of others for the first time. It would take a very special circumstance for Jenny to trust her restaurant to them in this way. Both Rafe and Ailsa knew that, but this was a special occasion. Tonight, she was cooking a romantic dinner for two in her cottage for a special guest. A very special guest. Tonight, the handsome young Ranger Gillen was coming to dinner. Resolutely, Jenny turned her back on the restaurant and strode up the high street of Wensley Village. It felt unnatural for her not to be in the kitchen at this time of day, preparing for the evening dinner service. But she had left Ailsa and Rafe in charge, and she had to trust to the fact that she had trained them well. After all, I have to have some time off occasionally, she muttered, resisting the almost overwhelming temptation to rush back and see what disasters had occurred in the two and a half minutes since she had left. She entered the butcher's stall, halfway down the high street. Edward, the butcher, looked up and smiled as he saw her. Jenny was an excellent customer, of course, buying large amounts of his product for her restaurant. And on top of that, she was extremely pretty. Just the sort of young lady that butchers the world over enjoyed flirting with. Ah, Mistress Jenny, looking more beautiful than ever, he boomed. You've brought a light of rare beauty into my dim little shop. Jenny rolled her eyes at him. I see you have a surplus of tripe available today, Edward. He laughed, unabashed. Ha <laughs> ha, bear with me, Jenny. There's few as pretty as you come in here in a day, and you should know it. You're a rare treat for these poor old eyes. Edward was barely 35. But it's an unfailing trait of butchers to behave as if each customer is far, far younger than they. With the more mature housewives, it was probably a good tactic, Jenny thought. Do you have my order? she asked. She enjoyed the hearty, good-natured atmosphere of the butcher's shop, but today she was in a hurry. Edward turned to his apprentice, who had been watching their exchange, with a grin on his face. Dilbert, fetch Miss Jenny's order, Edward said, then added, Dina ra tuo bati. Jenny smiled to herself. It was another peculiarity of the butcher's trade that they learned to talk in butcher speak, which were words pronounced backwards. This allowed butchers to have private conversations, even when their shop was full of customers. Often, the remarks passed were about the customers themselves, although the customers never had the faintest idea what was being said. Edward was obviously letting Dilbert get some practice in this strange language and had just said, and hurry about it. Jenny had discovered this strange phenomenon some time ago and had secretly practiced backwards speak herself. Now she smiled as Dilbert moved towards the cool room. I po si a sina gelf of bemal she said sweetly, and both the butcher and his apprentice let their jaws drop as she told them that she hoped it was a nice leg of lamb. Edward hurriedly searched his memory, trying to recall if he had ever said anything disparaging about Jenny in butcher speak. He thought not, but he couldn't be sure. Sensing his concern, she smiled at him. You'll never know, she said, and he hurriedly looked away from her and went back to slicing a rump of beef into thick steaks. Dilbert returned, 
carrying a leg of lamb, and placed it on the counter for Jenny's inspection. It was a prime piece of meat, its freshness confirmed by the whiteness of the fat glistening around the edges. Jenny eyed it critically, a slight frown on her face. It would never do to let Edward know that she was too pleased with his produce. She poked the leg, feeling the slight resilience in the flesh, then slapped it with the flat of her hand, creating a resounding smack. She nodded, satisfied at the sound. If asked, she would have been at a loss to explain why she invariably tested a piece of meat by slapping it. It was merely part of a ritual that she had developed over the years. That's fine, Edward. Wrap it for me, please. Edward nodded to Dilbert and the boy produced a length of clean muslin and proceeded to wrap it around the leg of lamb. As he did so, Edward glanced slyly at Jenny. Not too much for just two people, is it? he asked. Jenny shook her head. She had thought her dinner with Gillen was a private affair, although she should have known that it was impossible to keep a secret in this village. But Edward was right. The leg was a little large for just her and Gillen. She estimated that it was close to three kilograms in weight, but whatever was left over would go to good use. Whatever we don't eat, I'll give to the orphans in the ward, she told him. Edward raised his eyebrows. Lucky orphans, he said. He knew Jenny's reputation as a cook. Jenny placed the wrapped leg in her basket. Thanks, Edward, she said. It's a nice piece of meat. I'll try to do it justice. She smiled, including Dilbert in her thanks, and left the shop.